Okay, hello everybody, um, and welcome to a, a webcast. Um, the CPA Canada's uh, um, webinar about uh, reviving Canada's economic health, and uh, we're going to take a close look at the question about how we can improve uh, improve um, with fairness and an opportunity and prosperity and taking a close look at our economic recovery going forward. Um, it's an honor to be here discussing this with you, especially because this seems like a very um, important opportunity um, and for, for all of you to um, put your views forward about uh, for pre-budget consultations and, and, and uh, do some serious thinking about how best to move Canada's economy forward. But also um, I'm very much looking forward to an engaging discussion with two of Canada's leading minds in economics. Um, it, particularly because I think this is a, a, a time when Canada has been through its sharpest and shortest recession ever. Um, we saw millions of millions of Canadians lose their jobs and then get them all back and then lose them again a couple of times over as the waves of COVID-19 passed through. Um, we saw a new appreciation for essential workers, but also a huge toll um, on low-income workers in particular. Um, we saw stock markets boom, we saw housing prices soar, and now we are awash in personal savings. We're also awash in government debt, and we have an awful lot of uh, uncertainty about what the pandemic will uh, recovery will look like. So we will hear from um, uh, from from Jimmy Jean and Robert Asselin uh, about about um, their thoughts on all of these subjects. I'll, I'll um, introduce them more thoroughly in a few minutes. But just to go through the agenda for today a little bit, um, we will be. I'll be asking for you to respond to two questions um, during the course of this conference, um, and you'll be able to submit your your answers to those questions. Function. Um, and uh, CPA Canada is going to use your ideas from your responses um, to prioritize their uh, their pre-budget submission. And so it doesn't just go off into the void. It's not just not just a piece of interesting information. This will actually be quite useful in informing the association's approach to uh, fiscal policy. Um, and uh, so the, just a little bit of house, housekeeping. The Q&A function will be also used for submitting questions and comments. And there is simultaneous French translation, uh, which is available um, to you if, you if you choose to listen in French as well. So um, before we get fully started with um, our panelists, uh, there are a couple of words um, from CPA Canada's president and CEO, Charles-Antoine Saint-Jean, who is uh, going to appear to you on video. Hello, bonjour. Thank you for participating in today's discussion. There's a lot of uncertainty about how the economy and our lifestyle will evolve in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. As restrictions are lifted and vaccination rates increase, we're seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. Yet, significant challenges remain. J'ai surtout vu les inégalités que l'adversité apportée par la pandémie a fait mettre dans, dans le pays. Certaines entreprises ont mieux réussi, d'autres ont dû fermer ou ralentir, devenant plus vulnérables. The House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance has initiated its consultation on what measures the federal government should include in its next budget. The government faces a difficult balancing act. It must continue to address the immediate needs of Canadian and the business community while not losing sight of the need to strengthen Canada's economy over the longer term. CPAs work across all sectors and have a deep appreciation of the economic consequences arising from the pandemic. You're providing strategic guidance to your clients, organizations, and communities. This frontline knowledge is essential if we are to identify realistic approaches to establish a more resilient economy moving forward. We're eager to hear from your thoughts and have to assemble a lineup to see of distinguished speakers who will help us take stock to see of the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. La pandémie n'est pas le seul facteur qui transforme l'économie. Il y a la technologie, les changements climatiques et la concurrence mondiale. Ces tendances et autres défis redéfinissent la profession. Help shape our pre-budget commentary by sharing your views. Votre rapport est apprécié et la discussion se poursuivra. We're talking about reviving Canada's economy and the future of the profession on Engagement HQ, a digital platform. If you're not already a part of it, uh, that discussion and that conversation, please join us. We look forward to your viewpoints during this webinar and online afterwards. Thank you very much. Merci et à bientôt. 
Okay, so first I'll, I'll just do a brief introduction of our, our two um, panelists here, and uh, they will each do a brief introduction, and then we'll get into a more full-fledged discussion and hopefully hear, hear from you as well um, with your questions. So um, first we'll hear from Jimmy Jean, who is the um, Vice President and Chief Economist uh, and Strategist for the Desjardins Group. He directs research analysis and forecasting um, and makes uh, recommendations on a variety of issues, monetary policy, macroeconomic developments, and the outlook for interest rates. Um, so he is um, act, he also is the is Desjardins uh, chief spokesperson on economic news and major issues affecting the economy and financial markets. And so he is into the day-to-day um, nitty gritty of all the data that's out there and and um, has some uh, very um, provocative thoughts on all of that. So we'll hear from him first and then we'll go um, to Robert Asselin, who is the Senior Vice President of Policy at the Business Council of Canada. Um, he is leading the Council's work on economic recovery and um, putting together policy recommendations on that contribute to economic growth and job creation. Um, and he's also a specialist in fiscal and tax policies. Um, before he joined the council, um, Robert was uh, head of public policy at BlackBerry, and he also spent a decade involved in ac providing economic advice to government. He was the budget director for, um, for um, the former finance minister, Bill Morneau, and he was also a policy advisor to Paul Martin and Justin Trudeau. Um, so let's hear, first of all, from um, Jimmy Jean. We'll hear some initial thoughts from you about, uh, about where we're at in the economy. Sure, thanks very much, Heather, and uh, greetings to everyone for uh, attending this uh, webinar. Um, I guess we are the 21st of July, which means we're already more than halfway to this year, 2021. And, uh, you know, the way I would characterize the year so far is so far so good. Uh, remember, we started the year with a lot of optimism. I think you look at financial markets, we were seeing both, uh, you know, equities, bond yields, uh, the, the, all those were trending higher in the first quarter of the year. We had corporate spreads, which were very tight. Uh, crude oil was picking up. The U.S. dollar was weakening. All those are the, the, the signs of a very strong uh, risk on uh, optimistic climate in financial markets. And you saw that uh, optimism uh, permeate in, uh, through the business community and business surveys, consumer surveys. And uh, for very good reasons, uh, you know, first of all, you had the beginning of the vaccination campaign and that gave everybody the clarity that had been missing in 2020 over the eventual end of the pandemic and particularly the, the penalizing lockdowns that, that come with each uh, successive wave. And remember that those vaccines arrived way earlier than many experts were expecting, barely six months earlier, if we go back to July, 2020, uh, everybody, the, the consensus seemed to be that it would be more in late 2021 that uh, vaccines would start getting uh, administered. So the surprise factor was probably another uh, contributor to the optimism. Then you had, of course, the uh, election of Joe Biden, which uh, not only brought a calmer and more predictable tone to US, US politics, but it also helped secure, uh, and of course, with the help of the, uh, the majority in Congress, the, uh, the 1.8 uh, trillion American rescue plan, that's close to 9% of GDP. And uh, that was later uh, topped by the uh, infrastructure plan of 2.3 trillion and a family's plan to the tune of 2 trillion. Now those latter ones need to go through Congress still. Uh, they're being negotiated as we speak, but even uh, without accounting for those programs, the US stimulus tallies up to 25% of GDP, which is something unseen uh, in any other post-war recession. And, you know, if you think the U.S. went overboard, well, you know, look at Canada, uh, we rank just behind. We have stimulus well over 20% of GDP rolled out since the beginning of this crisis. Uh, of course, we can argue all day long about the magnitude and the composition of the spending, but, you know, from a macro perspective, it's, it's very hard to be pessimistic with so much fiscal intervention in the system. And then another reason for the optimism was how uh, effective these uh, interventions uh, have been in 2020 in terms of preventing business bankruptcies, consumer bankruptcies. We actually saw business bankruptcies in the US drop to almost a record low in 2020. And it's a, it's a similar story here in Canada. Uh, I mean, never you, you see bankruptcies decline when there's a recession and when the unemployment rate goes up. As a matter of fact, never do you see personal disposable income rise when the unemployment rate rises, but you know, with the help of the extraordinary income support measures we've seen, the SERB, the, the enhanced employment insurance, and so on, that's that's what we ended up with. And, and one of the things that 
uh, this did was to really push savings higher so that now consumers are, as you mentioned, flush with liquidity. And we, we know that liquidity is a vital ingredient to spending. Uh, in 08 09, it was com the complete opposite. We had uh, you know, consumers that ran out of cash, banks were tightening credit. Uh, so it's a complete different story. It's a complete different uh, recession. And it's, it's been a very short recession. We had the uh, NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research in the US, just uh, uh, dating this recession at, at a big two months. Uh, two months, but uh, a very intense recession still, you know, over those two months, which uh, are essentially between February and, and, and April, we have Canadian GDP contract 17.6%. That's, uh, you know, more than three times the contraction we had in 08, 09. So uh, short, but, but, but very intense nonetheless. Uh, but now, uh, you know, I think with the execution of emergency policy and the early arrival of vaccines, uh, all these uh, have been a very potent driver of growth. Uh, I mean, where we stand now, uh, you know, to look at, for example, uh, industrial production at a global level, uh, you know, the nature of this pandemic has uh, caused uh, a, a much bigger rebound in demand for goods. Uh, when you look at global industrial productions, uh, uh, that's, that reflects that shift towards goods. And that managed to recover to its pre-pandemic level in only nine months. After 08, 09, it took 21 months to get there. On the services side, you're seeing reopenings across developed economies uh, with the vaccination effect, including here in Canada. Uh, so the severely affected sectors are rebounding, and that's consistent with our forecast that services would be the primary contributor to consumer spending growth uh, starting in the second half of this year. Uh, but what we're also hearing a lot about these days is the Delta variant and, uh, and well, the risks from variants in general. Of course, uh, as we have new cases rising in, in many countries, it, it brings back those fears. But we have to keep in mind that this is the first wave that it will be occurring with a large share of populations having been uh, vaccinated in many countries. So uh, if this wave manages to spare health systems, uh, our assumption remains that governments will take a much lighter touch on restrictions at the domestic level. So uh, what that means is that we expect GDP growth of 6% uh, this year at the global level. Uh, that comes after the 3.6% uh, contraction of 2020. Uh, in the U.S., our expectation is 6.8%. In Canada, we have 6.3%. Uh, and these GDP numbers will not only bring us back to pre-pandemic levels, but close uh, the output gaps. Uh, we think the output gap is closed as of the second quarter in the U.S. Uh, in Canada, we expect this to happen in the fourth quarter. Uh, and, of course, you have pressures on inflation that this brings. Uh, and that's why we think that uh, central banks, even though they have promised to, to be very uh, lenient on this, uh, are still in the process of unwinding their extraordinary measures, and particularly asset purchases. Uh, we have this process uh, underway in Canada already. We think it gets underway in the U.S. Uh, in uh, around September, uh, October. Uh, and, uh, and then next year, uh, we should, uh, we should uh, start to see uh, interest rates being lifted off their current floor, although we expect this to be a, a fairly gra gradual process, but uh, it's still a case that the recovery means that you, you have net less of a need for uh, those kind of very extraordinary measures. Uh, so that covers it for my initial remarks, uh, but we can touch on some of these topics and, and other ones uh, later. Um, thank you for, for your for your comments and your your optimism is uh, refreshing, I would say, after a year of, um, you know, living from from bad data point to bad data point. It's uh, it's it's uh, quite uplifting to hear a, a positive outlook like that. Um, Robert, let's turn to you. Um, and uh, you have a I mean, you're coming at this from a bit of a, a different perspective in terms of uh, a policy and uh, the broader business community. Um, how do you see uh, how, how do you see our where, where would you position us right now? Merci, Heather, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Delighted to be with you. I'll, I'll do a few comments maybe on the short term, just to complete what uh, my colleague Jimmy said. Um, I, I, a, a few uh, caveats maybe. I think we are going through a significant retooling of the economy. And I say retooling because I don't think we'll go back to where we were on so many fronts, and I'll try to explain why. Um, first, what I'm seeing in the short term is that the supply side is struggling to adjust to this sugar high demand that we're going through. 
I think that is causing significant bottlenecks, difficulties. Uh, and that's where I think the debate on inflation starts uh, in the short term, but potentially on the medium and long term. Uh, the capacity for us to boost the supply side. I'll say on the light labor market side that I think there are significant challenges and adjustments going forward. Uh, we're seeing a shortages of workers in many sectors, key sectors, fast rising sectors, I should say. We're seeing a mismatch between supply and demand in the labor market that I think could be potentially problematic going forward. And obviously, because of the generosity of governments, including uh, in Canada, there's a lack of incentives in the short term, I think, to, uh, especially for low wage worker to get back in the labor force, which I think is creating, uh, is starting to create some problems. Uh, so this is something that is difficult for governments, obviously, to withdraw support. But at one point, uh, a bit like monetary, this will need to be done, otherwise, uh, the supply side would suffer. Just on the out output gap, what uh, Jimmy said, I think is right. Uh, what we're seeing interestingly is the US output gap has filled already where it was pre-pandemic, but with less workers and significant less workers, which suggests that to my earlier point, there might be structural changes in the labor market. And it could also mean that there's a boost in productivity, which I think is uh, it could be good news, especially if it's technologically driven. On inflation, obviously, it's a big debate. I will say that, uh, it, you know, uh, I see a lot of economists forecasting. And given my own experience with forecasts, especially at Finance Canada, I think one remains uh, needs to remain humble about forecasting inflation. But I think, again, the risk is more on the supply side than on demand side. In other words, the productive capacity of the economy to respond to what is going on. Uh, I see uh, many outstanding issues. Uh, what will people do with savings? As Heather uh, mentioned, I think is a big question. Will they keep it? Will they spend it? Will they be uh, balanced about keeping some? Spending some, I think, is a big question in the recovery. Uh, what will happen with fiscal stimulus? Um, how government will wind down the stimulus will be, I think, a key question. Monetary policy, I think, is uh, really interesting right now. Uh, the central banks, uh, centrally in the U.S., has put forward a new framework where they are willing to overshoot their, tar their target for some time uh, to attain 2% on a sustained basis. I think this causes uh, potentially some risk in terms of St uh, financial stability, financial volatility in the markets. We'll see how it goes. In Canada, we know that the bank has started uh, tapering uh, QE slowly, but still uh, very dovish in the way that they look at the, uh, the economy going forward. I I'll just say in the short term to close that uh, we've been stuck with secular stagnation uh, for a while since basically the great financial crisis of 08. So for those... Uh, who don't remember about secular stagnation. It's essentially this lack of growth with lack of productivity we've been seeing in the economy, uh, lack of business investment uh, going forward. The question is, will we be able to come back? Uh, you know, are we coming back to a normal of uh, suboptimal investments or are we able to actually use this slingshot effect of the pandemic and use technology, for example, to become more productive and uh, change this trend that we had before. Uh, just in closing, a few thoughts on long-term growth. I think it's really important to ask ourselves uh, and not com be complacent about the future. And the issue here is we need to ask ourselves, especially policymakers, where do we think growth will come from? And this is a challenge uh, in Canada, because I think we've been very complacent, a very uh, consumption-led recovery, real estate booming, and uh, savings, you know, driving the uh, consumption going forward. I think we need to stay focused on the productive uh, part of investments, uh, boosting our productive capacity going forward. This is something Canada struggled with. We have aging demographics. This is a ticking bomb for Canada. 
and we have a productivity issue that has been outstanding. So I think we just need to remain focused on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I love that idea of a slingshot effect. I like that term. It's uh, it leads to all sorts of um, options um, that we could, uh, you know, that that, that that government and business alike could take forward. Um, before we um, dig into some of the details there, I want to get to the first um, polling question um, to the audience. And so um, I will I'll read the question and, and you can, I think, I believe you were also able to read the question. Um, so send in your responses and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. So in the year ahead, what will be the greatest challenge faced by businesses? Will it be lingering uncertainty uh, due to COVID-19 and its impacts? Is it attracting and retaining workers? Is it transitioning to a low carbon economy? Pivoting the business? maintaining supply chains, and the last option is liquidity and assessing finance. Uh, I'm glad it's you that's answering and not me because I would say all of the above, um, but I think you're only allowed to answer one. <laughs> so um, we'll just take a minute here and I think we will have some immediate results. It's almost like a game show. Get <laughs> right away. Um, and these, I believe, um, will be, your answers will be used to, um, to uh, contribute to the uh, to the to the pre-budget submission um, from CPA Canada. Um, okay, so it looks like the winner is lingering uncertainty is the uh, is a top uh, top challenge, um, and you know I guess doesn't that just define everything about about where the uh, where the pandemic recession has been right? We just we keep getting hit by these waves. And um, so I'll just, if I could take that a little bit further, that uncertainty, I, I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, Canada is typically quite cautious in its approach to everything, to business, to investment, and to the pandemic itself. Does that help us position ourselves um, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, being attractive, I guess, if everybody out there is, is, is uncertain and reluctant to move ahead, maybe Canada's caution at this point is a competitive advantage. Um, uh, Robert, do you want to start with that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. What we've seen is obviously government putting high emphasis on people's health, which I think is obviously right. And, uh, you know, everything is secondary to that. But obviously, as we move forward and as people are getting vaccinated, uh, there's, um, you know, uh, an economic emphasis to be thought of. And I'm thinking that we now have the tools 18 months after we should have the tools anyway to do testing. Uh, we know that we have a high level of vaccination compared to other countries. So I think one needs to overcome this psychological drama we went over and kind of move forward on reopening. Obviously, always being prudent, uh, not overburdened hospitalization, which I think right now is under control. Uh, but you know, responsibly, I think there's a there's a there's a way forward uh, without uh, government being overly prudent. Um, Jimmy, what, what do you think? I mean, we're, there's so much talk now about a fourth wave, um, you know, looking at looking at the UK, um, they've got high numbers there, but, you know, not as much as doesn't seem to be as lethal this time around, but the markets are reacting anyway. Um, you know, how well is Canada positioned to take this kind of risk of another wave into account? Generally speaking, you look at how the, uh, you know, our handling of the pandemic, um, so far, uh, I think compared to, to many countries, uh, you look at the, the death toll, uh, the number of hospitalizations, uh, I think we can be broadly satisfied. It's also with the vaccination, it, 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 it was a slow start, but right now we're one of the, uh, we have the highest, one of the highest rates of vaccinations among the developed countries. So, uh, so Canada did come through uh, and uh, you look at, uh, you know, what, the, the population wants the various surveys, uh, broadly supportive of, uh, of what's been done. Uh, for example, the borders, uh, that was a tough one because there was a lot of pressure on the part of the business community to reopen the borders rapidly, but uh, surveys consistently told that uh, the population did uh, support the, the more cautious approach. And, um, you know, you, you see it in how uh, Canada responds uh, or, or recovers uh, from each successive wave. I mean, the first quarter was uh, was a, a decisive in sending that message. 
I mean, at the the beginning of the quarter, we were expecting uh, GDP to contract because we were in the middle of that uh, of that second wave, uh, and uh, you have pretty deep and penalizing lockdowns, especially in Quebec and Ontario. And it ended up with a 5.6% expansion, which surprised everybody, including the Bank of Canada. So uh, the, the, the Canadian economy has also demonstrated its, uh, its resilience, its ability to cope with the uh, lockdown environment. And whenever those lockdowns are lifted, you see uh, usually a big snapback in employment uh, and, and something we haven't quite seen to the same extent in the U.S. So. Uh, I think the measures in place show that, broadly speaking, even if they're not perfect, uh, for sure, but broadly speaking, compared to how other uh, economies are faring, uh, I think we can generally say that it's satisfactory. So I, I'm just, just just to follow up on the on your point about the the, the government pandemic support, um, you know, it, it, it's been extraordinary, right? We've never seen anything quite this big before. Um, but I wonder, um, does it just postpone a day, a day of reckoning or does it actually get us through and help us through to the other side? Um, Jimmy, do you want to, Robert, you touched on this earlier, so I want to hear from Jimmy and then I'll get to you. Well, for sure, there's a, uh, there, there are already uh, important conversations uh, we're having on this, the, the debt sustainability uh, and, uh, and, you know, the impact uh, 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 that this crisis will have on uh, future generations in terms of footing the bill. And, and hence, uh, you know, to, to Robert's points earlier about the, 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 how crucial it is uh, that those investments are well targeted and support uh, lifting the uh, productive capacity of the economy. Uh, that couldn't be, you know, more important than, uh, than now. Uh, given that uh, this is ultimately how those uh, how the spending will pay for itself is, is, is if we're able to, uh, to to make the investments necessary to lift our productivity. Uh, so so I think the conversation is, uh, you know, has been uh, right to have, but it was probably when we were still in the middle of an emergency, uh, it was probably not kind of the, the, the right moment. Uh, you know, as we we're still in, in in that pandemic, it's not over. It's not game over yet. And we sense that uh, things are getting better, or that we're better able as a society to to, to cope with the uh, with the virus and live with the virus uh, with the help of the vaccines. Uh, but uh, but but certainly uh, the pressure as we move forward, the, the pressure is going to be uh, higher and higher. We're dealing with a number of uh, of issues when it comes to. Um, uh, the, uh, our, our productivity, our, our, our capacity to in innovate, which has been lagging, uh, and uh, you know we, we've uh, we've been able to grow the economy through through immigration, uh, basically to adding more people. But uh, uh, you're going to find it more difficult going forward because you have a new U.S. administration that welcomes more uh, immigrants better than uh, the previous administration. Uh, and also you're, you're, you're dealing with lingering issues related to integrating some, some of those immigrants. So, uh, you know, I think uh, we, we have, uh, even though we can be satisfied, there's still a lot of wood to chop in Canada and including uh, the, the, the transition uh, to a lower carbon economy and, and more sustainable uh, economic model for the country. So uh, definitely uh, it, it doesn't mean that we, we don't have a, a lot of lot of work for, for the years to come. Um, so Robert, you've been in, you've spent your time in government. Um, you know, is the, it, are we, have we just postponed a day of reckoning here? Or is the government gonna actually be, ca be capable of, you know, taking all of this pandemic support and reining it in um, and uh, I guess getting us um, back to a more normal path on uh, a fiscal policy? It's an interesting question. I, I would reframe it a bit slightly because it'll put me in less controversial position. Uh, I, I guess the, 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 way, the, way I, the way I see it is if you have $100 billion to invest, and I use the word invest, what do you want to invest in? You want, you, you want a, I return to your investment and to, to what both I think Jimmy and I said is that it's better to invest in things that will make the economy more productive the critical, um, my, 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 the critical, I guess, uh, approach one could take about what the government has done is that it has not pivoted yet to a more kind of long-term growth lens. And I still focus, in my view, too much on the short term, maybe for political reason. I don't want to really explore that here, but I think 
there was a point in the pandemic where we needed to, p- to pivot. I think the budget was probably the right moment. In my view, we didn't do it uh, enough, enough, enough in the long term. And that will cause, I think, more fiscal problem because what you don't want is to spend 100 billion and end up in four years under 2% growth. You want that $100 billion to result in, you know, 0.5 or 1% GDP growth over time. And so you have better infrastructure, better uh, reskilling of the labor force. You have immigrants, skilled immigrants coming in, contributing to the economy. You have uh, childcare for, so that women can integrate the labor force uh, earlier and they, you know, uh, after they have their, their kids, that kind of stuff, as opposed of uh, just sending a, lo- a bunch of liquidity in the system that results in unforeseen uh, problems such as, uh, you know, boosting the demand in housing and creating uh, a bit of a, you know, potential bubble in that market and those kinds of problems that uh, I think could be uh, significant for the economy going forward. So I think the the kind of divide between short term and long term is where I would position the spending here. So that is an uh, that's an excellent introduction to the second question, our second polling question um, for the audience. So I'm going to read that question out, and please get ready to answer it. Um, for the longer term, what should be the government's number one consideration to help guide the economic recovery? Should it be fostering the digital economy, transition to a low carbon economy, reskilling and revised income supports for workers, or modernizing the tax system? So you could like digital, low carbon, support for workers, or tax. Which, what, what should be the priority in guiding the economic recovery? Um, and again, I want to choose all of those things. <laughs> I don't, it's hard, it's hard to separate one from the other, especially. Um, so we'll see how, um, you know, and I think we, we saw in the last budget, we saw, um, tastes of all of these things. You know, we did see, um, a push somewhat towards a whole bunch of small initiatives towards the di- digital economy. Um, we saw a big push, and I think we hear a lot of talk about the um, environment side of things and how to build back better um, in a low carbon way. Whether or not that will work is uh, always open to question. And then um, we did see a fairly d- big sized um, skills and support question, but that very much feeds into the digital economy, I think, too, because uh, I guess what we've seen during the pandemic is so many businesses moving on side. Um, to uh, to moving online, pardon me, and um, changing the way the workforce works. And of course, tax. Is that the best way to go to change policy? Okay, we have some results and we have a tie um, between um, reskilling and revised income supports for workers and modernizing the tax system. Um, and I find that pretty interesting because um, it's not clear to me that um, using, I, I wonder about using the tax system um, so let's, I wonder about using the tax system as a way to make the country more competitive and take us forward. You know, I, I, there are obviously tweaks that can be made in taxes, but, um, you know, is that is that the main tool that we need to use to, to recover here? Um, I'd like to, um, so let's focus a little bit more on going forward, recovery near term and, and long term. Um, Let's, um, so Robert, do you want to start us off a little bit about, about taxes and their role in, in taking us forward? And in particularly, I think you have some views on industrial strategy, which is not necessarily tax policy. So I'm hoping you can mix those together yeah. a little bit for us. I, you know, on tax policy, I think overall, what is important is to keep uh, our competitive advantage. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, there's confidence in the business community over the long term that uh, nothing crazy will be done to stop investments and confidence of investors. I think overall, uh, we've reached probably the psychological threshold of what's reasonable on the income side. Uh, Most of jurisdictions, you combine provincial and federal, are over 50% on the top marginal tax rate, I think is as far as you could go. the debates on uh, capital gains and all that stuff, I think is, is tricky because first, um, there's not as much money as people think. And second, I think it's politically salient for people to may, who may wanna go there to say, we're gonna 
go after these rich people. But I think uh, the downside on the business investment and just the confidence of uh, people in the economy, Canadian economy, uh, would be shaken. So I, I don't think it is um, it's a good proposition. What I'll say is, of course, our tax code is too complicated. It has been overlaid unnecessarily over the years. A part of it is because it's become politically popular to just add a bunch of tax credits for constituencies. I think that's probably the wrong thing uh, to advocate going forward. So simplification is good. The problem with tax policy overall, I believe it uh, in the first row kind of thing is uh, you, you can't just create a bunch of losers. You have to have some winners, otherwise politically it won't be really attractive for people to make changes. So I know CPA has been advocating for that, but uh, one needs to be thoughtful about the simplification and who loses and who wins over the changes. Um, I, I'll, I'll just say uh, overall, uh, on industrial policy, it, it's a topic that has come back. Um, at the end, what it comes down to is advanced industries. And for Canada to pick up where it can on areas of growth uh, going forward in the future, every country, I think, is becoming much more intentional, deliberate, or where they want to be in 5, 10, 15 years. You look at the US under Biden, you look at uh, Germany, uh, the Asian countries, obviously China, leading on science technology. I think we need to stop thinking in this Washington consensus frame that markets will take care of everything. Government has a limited role in R&D where externalities are difficult for the private sector to, uh, to solve for. So I think we need to be focused on sectors where we have an advantage. And in my view, those have been identified by people like Dominic Barton, who led an important exercise with the adv Advisory Council and Monique Leroux, who's done similarly recently with the Industry Strategy Council. Biotech, clean tech, ag tech is where Canada can lead. And we need intentional framework to for, for, for a public-private partnership on those. Um, thanks. I want to talk actually a little bit about a near term problem um, in response to some of the questions that are coming through to quite a few of the questions actually are about inflation and Jimmy I'm going to turn to you about the, on this and I know you have uh, your shop has been started to pay very, very close attention to the minutia in inflation, keeping a close eye on that. Um, where can you break that down for us a little bit where do you see inflation heading and what has to happen to make sure um, that not just in Canada, but globally, that we keep it under under control and don't get into some really nasty um, because of inflation rising too quickly. Right. So, so I think right now, uh, you know, the it's it's taking everybody by surprise. You just had the latest number in the U.S. Uh, Five point four percent. Uh, we haven't seen uh, that kind of uh, high inflation since. Uh, in, the, in terms of the headline number since uh, 2008, uh, but if we remember back in 2008, there was a, a big oil price shock. Uh, if we take core CPI that actually excludes food and energy, uh, what we find is that this measure reached the uh, four and a half percent in June, and that's actually the highest uh, since uh, since 1991. So in, uh, in 30 years, so here in Canada, we have inflation pressures that are also very important right now, 3.6 percent. Yeah, Bank of Canada has a, a tolerance range, which goes from one to three percent, but you know we're we're above that. Uh, so uh, on our side, we've been consistently revising our inflation forecast higher for the U.S. We we, we now have four point two percent, which uh, would be again the biggest, uh, the highest uh, level of inflation since nineteen ninety one. Uh, and uh, and Canada, we uh, I mean our last forecast at two point six percent, but. Uh, you know, we we just had the bank handle last week coming out with the three percent expectation for this year. So basically, that's a, a you know for 2021, 2022, high inflation is pretty much uh, that there's an agreement that we, we have a high inflation. Now the question is, uh, how sustained will that be? How persistent will it be? And it's still the case uh, when we drill down, when we look at the uh, the, the drivers of that inflation right now. Uh, for example, in the U.S. Uh, we see that the most of the pressures come from uh, everything that's related to autos. Uh, and uh, we understand what's happening in autos. There's a problem of shortage of semiconductors that's uh, been affecting uh, productions. We've seen production of autos both in Canada and the U.S. plunge. 
uh, that uh, has spillover effects to the used car segment where you have a big shortage and huge uh, pressures on prices. You have rental companies that are, uh, you know, rushing in to, 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 to buy uh, vehicles so that contributes to the shortage you're seeing in use, the used vehicle segment, and that's pushing prices higher. So, you know, that's, that's a big factor behind the growth. Uh, you also have, you know, the sectors that are recovering, the, the travel tickets, the, the, the hotel prices, all those are recovering, but they're recovering from very low levels. They're just kind of normalizing. But, you know, when the way we look at inflation, which is a year over year calculation, it influences the, uh, the, the metrics. We know that these effects will be uh, temporary. At, at one point, uh, you know, prices are not going to be rising forever. Uh, they're going to recover to to a level that may be close to 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 the levels of uh, pre-pandemic, and then you know that effect on inflation will will wane. So so what we're we're really left with, and what central banks really uh, are going to be focusing on, they're, they're, they believe that those parts you know, there's some exaggeration, and you know we have to be careful and overly interpreted the current uh, high inflation. But what they're really going to be focusing on. Uh, is something uh, Robert alluded to uh, again earlier, is, is really the supply and the demand. How much of the supply has been destroyed uh, during this pandemic? Uh, what uh, sectors are, uh, where, where is, what's the end game for sectors? I mean, some tech sectors are going to return to the old normal. Some sectors are going to return to a new normal that's weaker than the old normal. Uh, and some sectors are actually going to benefit. So, uh, you know, how all, all of this shakes out will determine uh, where we end up in terms of, of the, the demand versus the supply. We know that the demand is heavily stimulated by uh, the liquidity that's been accumulated last year right now. But, uh, you know, as the economies are reopening, the supply is slowly coming back. We, 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 there's a big uncertainty right now as to uh, you know, what at what level we, it will end. So it's essentially an output gap question. We have the economies, we expect the economies to be in the state of excess demand uh, starting now, but to what degree? And the higher, the more we are in excess demand, the more that puts the, the sort of macro-based pressures on inflation. And that's what usually central banks respond to uh, by lifting rates, by tightening policy. Because, uh, you know, at 5.4%, uh, if this were 08 or 09, rates would be going higher in a hurry right now. <laughs> this is not happening. So they're being lenient. They're understanding that, you know, that there, there are some causes and there are also some important structural drivers of the low inflation we had in the not last cycle. And central banks have not lost faith in the in these drivers, the globalization, the aging of the population, the digital the digitization of, of the economy. So all those, uh, most of those factors are still with us and uh, they've, been understood to, to exert a drag on inflation. So they very much believe that those uh, factors, when, when everything is done, when we clear the noise, uh, we're still going to be dealing with those uh, downward influences on inflation. And that's why they're not overly worried. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the extent of capacity destruction from this crisis will be the, 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 the one of the biggest determinants. And unfortunately, we, don't, we won't have clarity on that for uh, quite some time. Um, I want to cast forward a little bit more um, more broadly um, and, and and talk a bit about uh, climate change for a moment. Um, Hobart, um, are we ready to actually embrace that virtuous circle? Can Canada's economy, I mean, fine, clean tech is one sector, is economy-wide, though, we are pretty dependent on oil and gas. Um, so, you know, are we ready for that transition and, um, you know, or do we have to actually pick up the pace here? It's a great question. And... The way I see the problem of climate change and the way that I would think about it as a policymaker is uh, this way. I think we've worked so far, uh, we've worked well, and we have a comprehensive answer on the demand side, which is, in my view, carbon pricing. That part has been done. We've sent the signal to markets, financial markets, that uh, there'll be a price. There's incentives for changing behavior. So I think on the demand side, we've done what is required to change direction. Where I see a big gap, and I think we're not focusing enough, is on the supply side to bring this capacity to respond to this change in demand. It's a bit like what Jimmy described on inflation uh, just now. And in concrete terms, you might want people to drive EVs. If there's no charging station, 
you won't be able to drive those. You need, you need to build that supply side so that people can change their behavior. If we want to embark on hydrogen, for example, we need to build the infrastructure for distribution, production of hydrogen, which in the uh, current uh, we don't have. So for me, the discussion needs to shift on what is it that we need to do on the supply side to build uh, this you know, transitory econo economy. And I think on the energy sector, this is 10% of our GDP. This idea that we're just gonna divest and just go away and everything will be good is crazy in my view. We have to make sure that this industry has the tool to transform itself to become uh, responsible in terms of emissions, net zero. I think people have embraced this in the sector. They understand where the ball is going, but this is a transition. And this is where I think in R&D and where government has a role in innovation, for example, Bill Gates, Larry Fink, all these people, I think are agreeing to this is that this is an innovation play on the supply side, but we need to get on with it. This is not going to work with a few millions here and there. This is need to be a very concerted effort effort on the public-private partnership side. So far more deliberate than what we have already. Yes. Um, I want to turn to, um, we're, we're getting short on time and I, I want to talk about housing because it's so much, uh, I think it's on everybody's mind and everybody talks about it all the time, partly because, uh, you know, either you're uh, looking for a home or you already have one and the values are going all up and down. Um, Jimmy, I'm wondering, um, what, uh, I'm wondering what you think of in terms of the need to, um, I guess, better control or better, you know, take some of the heat out of the housing market. Is that, an, is that necessary? Can tax policy be used to do that? Um, and, uh, or, you know, is maybe this is just going to play itself out a little bit. Housing is just too expensive and it'll settle down all on, all on its own. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so this is one of the things we've been saying, you know, throughout the last uh, couple of months, or especially last spring, when you, you we were getting those record numbers on on the housing front in terms of uh, home sales and home prices uh, rising uh, higher and higher, and you had that uh, big outcry in Canada uh, to to use the tax system in particular to to rein in those uh, the, the appreciation and. We kind of had this, uh, you know, our analysis was telling us that the market was uh, very close to uh, to initiate a, a cool down because uh, we were looking at our uh, affordability uh, indicator uh, and it was deteriorating very rapidly. And, you know, usually when this happens, the market slows because people get uh, priced out of the market and, uh, and, and you see some impact on demand. It seems to be like uh, uh, that this is what we're starting to see. The last three months have come in lower in terms of uh, sales. Uh, they're still very high from a historical standpoint, but we're seeing the beginning of a uh, moderation, uh, an adjustment uh, in a context where prices remain high. Prices are, you know, continue to rise. Of course, there's a lag effect between uh, uh, transactions and prices. But uh, the, 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 the whole affordability uh, problem, I think that that is central and that's, uh, you know, the, the consumers or the buyers are responding to those, to those price signals. Uh, in addition to that, we're, uh, you know, we're right now we're reopening. So I guess people have other things to do than buying a home, but, you know, more importantly, I think it's the return to work that um, uh, a lot of people are preparing to uh, in uh, next fall. Uh, so uh, one of the big drivers of the housing market has been the, uh, the, the full telework regime where this allowed people to work uh, virtually anywhere. So you could buy homes in, in, in cheaper uh, areas and, 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 you know, in, in very distant uh, areas uh, compared to where they would work normally uh, compared to core urban areas. We, we see that the, 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 mo the more remote you were, the more those markets uh, tended to have a see prices rise very very rapidly uh, now with the return to to work even if in hybrid form uh, you know it's it becomes less interesting to uh, be purchasing in, those, in some of those markets especially given that prices have increased so much so that was also one of our assumptions uh, was that you know when fall comes uh, it's going to be less uh, you know that that extra demand coming from the telework uh, opportunities uh, that have been raised, you know, you're going to be seeing less of that. 
On top of that, you have a lot of construction because uh, you know we've seen yes demand, but you know uh, housing starts have increased to, to record levels as well, and that construction has been concentrated in the more remote localities where uh, there's demand, but there's also space to to build those houses, uh, unlike what you see uh, closer to, to to core areas. Uh, so so the, the 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 problem which has been uh, uh, to a great extent a problem of inventory. Uh, is going to get solved as the, those completions come on the market. So uh, I think the, 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 market, the, the market-based mechanisms are working. Um, on top of that, you had some regulatory uh, adjustments in June, uh, whereby the stress test, uh, the mortgage rate required at, at the stress test at, at, the, at the qualification has been risen. Uh, all these together, in our view, is sufficient, and we continue to expect that the housing market well, cool. And in 2022, uh, 22, we have actually uh, close to no price uh, appreciation. We have 2%, which is essentially inflation, normal inflation. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, issue being being solved. But it doesn't mean that you don't have affordability issues. It doesn't mean that you don't have a big inequality problem that's been created uh, in the wake of the pandemic, uh, given what we've seen in the, the housing market. Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess I'll just pick up. We just have time for one quick round here, but I was just to pick up on that. You know, I, I do wonder if that that inequality piece and if that that, uh, you know, the effect that we've seen on jobs um, and uh, the housing market and um, the, 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 the actual health effects of the pandemic itself repeatedly on low income workers. Um, and I do wonder if that is going to be a, a legacy that we struggle with uh, in the like post pandemic. So anyway, my last question for, for the two of you is, you know, fast, what do you imagine yourself saying in five years, if I say, what is the biggest economic legacy of this pandemic? You know, when we, when we think all the time about the great financial crisis of 2008 or nine and, and what, it, what it left with us, what are we gonna be saying about this, this, this go around of this crisis? Uh, I wanna go first on, on the hot seat. Yeah, I'm happy to. On the positive side, I hope it will be, it will have been the start of a innovation, um, a new innovation era that will drive productivity. I think if we digitalize our economy, I think we, if we take this opportunity to be more innovative, understand the, the centrality of intellectual capital going forward, I think this would have been very positive development. I'm hoping that would be the case. On the negative side, I think what we just discussed on inequality might be an unforeseen consequence in that uh, a consumption-led recovery would have led to higher inequality, uh, helping people buying more expensive house at the higher end and uh, low-wage workers struggling to really uh, get through this. And this is the unintended consequences of uh, high stimulus, both on the monetary and fiscal side is that when you inject that much liquidity in the economy, sometimes uh, the people at the lower end don't benefit from it. So I, I'm hoping it won't be the case, but I, I can see that could be, unfortunately, one of the uh, legacy of this. Okay, thanks. Jimmy, are you going to come back and add some optimism to that? Start the <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we're, we're talking about the, the, the legacies, uh, I think the way uh, fiscal and monetary policies responded might be a, a playbook that will be used again whenever we uh, we we hit another downturn. Now, uh, whether that's right or wrong, uh, we could debate this. But uh, you know, we're talking about only a two month recession. We're talking about a recession without bankruptcies and with high liquidity and the ability to bounce back rapidly. So certainly. Uh, some will see this uh, as a very, uh, as a positive and as the right way to to respond going forward, but it does come at the cost of uh, very rapid fiscal deterioration. Uh, and uh, and the worry I have, uh, which goes back to some of Robert's points, is that you know increasingly the, the, we lose that focus on making sure that the this uh, this stimulus is really targeted to promote growth in order to be able to pay for itself and that we end up burdening future generations. So in terms of legacies in 20, 30 years, uh, your future generations uh, will probably, unfortunately, have to foot uh, a big portion of the bill from this pandemic. 
Okay, I'm not quite as optimistic as where you started. Um, <laughs> so we're at the end of our time. And um, thank you so much for all your points and your thoughts, which were um, fast and furious and quite complex. And so um, I, I think um, I'll just point the audience to um, a way to continue this discussion. You can go to CPA Canada's Foresight website. Um, it's, uh, so it's foresight.cpacanada.ca. And uh, you can as, put your thoughts in there as well as talk about the future of your profession. Um, and a video of this webcast will also be posted on, on the website for CPA Canada. So if you missed a portion of the discussion or want to go back through some of the points as I do, because uh, I've got too much to think about now while talking, <laughs> um, then you can go back to the, to the website and revisit it. Um, there will also be a report summarizing the input that was received and your comments, um, and uh, that will be posted on the, on the website later this summer. Um, so just in closing, um, thank you so much to Robert and to Jimmy um, for, you, for your thoughts and your comments and your insight and, and also your, I guess, your, well, your big thinking about, about um, how, to, how to grapple with all the uncertainty that we've come through and where to take us going forward. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure.